So what is going on YouTube? Welcome back to the channel. Hope you're doing well. And today's video is a part two to the iPhone street photography POV video that I posted a week ago. In part one, we went for a quick walk around town. And now after doing quite a fair bit more walking around town and taking pictures with this thing, um, I've got quite a good overview of what this is like as a camera. Is it an addition to your camera kit? Is it a replacement? Is it something that you can legitimately use as a photography tool? Um, or is it still very much on the more gimmicky side? I will get into all of that throughout this video. Now, you can go into the description, have a look at the timestamps for various areas of the video that apply to you the most. Um, but before I go any further, let me just give you a bit of scope to the video and to my thinking for having this phone. So the first things first, th this video is gonna be about the camera and not about the phone. If you've come for a phone review, please look at other videos because this will not be a phone review. At the time of making this video, I don't have raw capability of the Apple Pro Raw on this yet. It's not out yet. So everything I talk about is JPEG related. <clears throat> I will most likely do a follow-up video when raw does come out. Now I've had various comments on the lines of why not use a proper camera? You have a, you know, why go for all of this effort with a phone, just buy a proper camera, especially given how much these phones cost, which is not cheap. Um, I disagree with that completely because living in a city, there are many areas that if you go into with a proper camera, you will get kicked out. You will, there are many places that will not even allow you to go inside with a camera places that have great views and you know amazing photo opportunities so having a camera that looks like a phone that's in your pocket um, and you can get into these places and take these pictures is worth its weight in gold that's why i pay a lot of attention to phone cameras um and that is really it. Now, the only other thing is if you're asking why it's an iPhone Pro and not the normal iPhone, it's because of the telephoto lens, which is what I use primarily for my street photography. Um, and this is the smaller Pro, not the bigger Pro Max, which is not out yet. I think that's the intro covered. Um, so yeah, let's get into the first section. Let's get going with ergonomics and ease of use because a camera that is easy to use and is fun to use is one that you'll use a lot and that's a good thing. So let's start with the camera app itself. Um, I use the default camera app and the reason for that, well, there's two reasons. First of all, it's much quicker to access it from the lock screen. And the second reason is when you do access it from the lock screen, the phone is still locked, which means if someone pinches your phone while you're out and about shooting, okay, they've got your phone, but it's locked, therefore it's almost useless. So those are the two reasons. Um, if you're doing landscape photography, you're with friends, or you're anywhere where speed and let's say some degree of security are not important, um, then by all means download a third party app. There are many out there um, which will give you more control over the camera as well as raw capability right now before the official update comes along. Um, speaking of launching the app to launch it from the lock screen is really quick i was actually surprised how quickly i could just tap on that button and be able to take photos in some cases it was like it felt like a second to do this whole task um i clearly remember there was someone walking towards me it was like there's no way i'll get that and i quickly managed to get it the next thing i want to touch on is the grip and how it's like holding this camera I had quite a few comments on the previous video saying why are all my pictures in portrait and not in landscape for the simple reason that I felt more secure holding the phone in portrait mode, how a phone is meant to be held. Every time I turned it around to go into landscape mode, I felt like I was going to drop it. Now, the new phone with the like, square edges does feel a lot more secure in the hand versus the older phones, which were more rounded. Um, but to really boost that level of, let's say, security in your hand, the uh, silicon case did provide quite a, bit, uh, a good rubberized grip. However, if I was gonna go out and do this properly for like a whole day, uh, what I would do is find a way to attach some kind of wrist strap so that if I am quickly changing from portrait to landscape and I drop the phone, um, at least I don't drop it on the floor. Now, the whole MagSafe uh, feature that you get 
what I would like to see here in the future, so if you make accessories, please, I hope you're listening, um, is some kind of a magnetic grip, you know, for the camera, maybe with a little Bluetooth shutter button, or basically some way where you can grip the camera like a more of a proper uh, camera grip versus just holding it like a phone. In terms of taking the photos, obviously you've got the shutter button on the screen, which is very conveniently placed where your thumb would naturally be, as well as the volume buttons um, on the side of the phone. Now, I tend not to use the volume buttons. I don't know why, but I just sometimes get a feeling that there's a bit of a delay between pressing the volume button and the photo being taken. Certainly using the screen seems to be a bit quicker. Also, when you're holding it in sort of this position, um, the volume buttons are at the bottom, which is a bit of an unnatural place. And if you turn the phone around so that the volume buttons are on the top where the shutter would normally be on the camera, I just found that my fingers would get into the lens very quickly because it's right next to the lens. So you kind of have to hold it like, like this, um, which is not a very secure grip. When it comes to changing lenses, the whole experience is very quick. I've not had any freezes or issues with that. The only thing I changed was the preview of the wider lens. So iPhone's got a feature that if you're using a telephoto lens, it will preview what a wider lens would look like using the top and the bottom part of the phone. I switched that off so it's just now black. And the reason for that is because I find it a lot easier to compose when all I can see on the screen is my composition and no extra information, which is not super relevant. I understand why they've done it, but for me personally, I find it distracting, which is why I've switched that off. When it comes to changing exposure, there are two ways of doing it. The first way, which I'm pretty sure is how everyone does it. You just tap on the screen, slide your finger up and down, exposure's changed. However, as soon as you recompose, it then resets. Now, the other way is to go into the secret little menu that most people don't even know about, I didn't know about it, and then you can click on an exposure slider and then you can slide it left to right and it remembers that change then for as long as you're using the camera. Now, I've tried both methods and I would honestly stick to the one where you just tap and drag up and down because I find it more intuitive and also I like the fact that it resets every time I change composition um, so then I don't lose track of where the exposure is, if that makes sense. In the last video, the POV video, there were a few comments to say that I didn't use burst mode and I didn't know burst mode existed. Well, burst mode does exist on this phone. There are two ways of activating it. The first way is to program the upper volume button, which you can do in settings. Um, it's great, but you obviously want to do it two-handed as well as you have to remember there's a delay. So when you press the volume button, it's like a second before he actually starts taking photos, which for most scenarios is not an issue, but if you're not aware of it, it can catch you off guard. The other way is to just slide the shutter button to the left as you start taking photos. There is no delay, but if you have small hands like I do, it can be very uncomfortable, again, unless you're using it uh, with two hands. Um, which way do I prefer? Personally, it's just by sliding the shutter button. It's more intuitive, um, but yeah. If you're gonna get the Pro Max, like the huge phone, then keep in mind that doing that one-handed can be a bit uncomfortable. One other thing that I found is that because the lenses are so exposed and you're handling your phone all the time, it's very easy to get them covered in your fingerprints, in dirt and things like that. So there were a couple of times when I went to take a photo, I wondered why it's so blurry and weird, and that's because there's a just big fingerprint smudge on the lens. So. It's something that you need to get into a habit of to always wipe the lenses on your shirt or something before you go taking pictures. It's just a little thing that I found during my use. So let's quickly round off this section with a couple of other little points. Uh, the screen is fantastic. It's great to see during broad daylight and it's very easy to compose with because it's such a good quality screen. Now, the overall uh, usability, shall we say, of the phone has been very, very good. Um, I've never had to wait for something to load. Everything's been very snappy, very quick, and overall a pleasure to use. In terms of weather resistance, these are waterproof, so you can use it in any weather, whereas with traditional cameras, you know, they might be water resistant, but in many cases, they, they have a limit before water does go in, as I've experienced many times. Uh, but with this, you have zero concerns. Now, in terms of like build quality, reliability, you know, it's a phone, it's an iPhone. They're all built like tanks. I've never had any issues with any iPhone since, I don't know, the iPhone 4. Um, so I don't really have any concerns there.
Now let's have a chat about battery life, which is quite a big negative, I think. Um, so let's, let me put it this way. I started taking photos when the phone was at 95%. I was then taking photos for about two hours. When I say taking photos, I was walking around and for three quarters of that two hours, the camera app was on, so the phone was on, and obviously I was just snapping away. In total, in that period, I took probably about five, 600 photos. Um, and then at the end of that particular walk, so two hours later, um, the battery was at 20%. Now, bear in mind, all I was doing is taking photos. I wasn't listening to music. I wasn't doing anything else other than having the camera app open. Now, the good thing with this is if you have a PD charger, you can just quickly top it up from 20 to like 50 in a few minutes. Um, however, the drain from 50 back down to 20 was also very quick as well. So if you're gonna go out and you know you're gonna be taking pictures for the entire day, just bring a small PD charger um, I've got one of those anchor ones which cost next to no money and it can charge your phone like two, three times very quickly. Now let's chat about image quality. So I want to remind you again, this is all to do with the JPEG photos out of the camera and not with the RAW because the RAW is not yet available. Now let's start with HDR, okay. Overall, I found HDR to be a big improvement on the previous phone. It looks more natural, it looks less cartoonish, and also it's doing a better job at resolving detail in trickier areas such as branches against a blue sky. I personally leave HDR switched on permanently because I found it's much easier to let's say un-HDR a photo when you edit than trying to get detail back that wasn't there because it wasn't captured. So if the phone can capture all information, then why not? Now, the biggest problem I have with the JPEG photos out of this camera is the sharpness. I find all photos to be comically sharp. Now, that is very subjective. You might completely disagree with me and you're absolutely right because uh, sharpness and color and image quality is a very subjective thing. I personally, or my style is very soft. I like very soft, very dreamy images which have next to no sharpness in them. So these images out the phone to me look like someone's just gone crazy with clarity and sharpness. Thankfully, it doesn't destroy the photos because you can kind of, let's say, make it better by reducing the clarity in your editing program, any decent editor will have a clarity slider. And if you just take that all the way down or at least halfway down, you will remove that overly sharp effect. Once you've removed that sharp effect, the images are very, very pleasant. The colors I think are really nice. Sometimes they can be a bit oversaturated, but again, it's nothing that you can't fix later. And generally speaking, I was very pleased with the overall image, the color in 95% of cases, um, and just the detail as well. It's only a 12 megapixel sensor, but even so, you can zoom in quite a fair bit and still have good detail. Now, in terms of image noise, obviously you're gonna get noise in the shadows. It's a very small sensor, it's physics, you can't get around it. Um, there's no real way to get around it that I have found. The only way is to just know what you're taking a picture of and don't underexpose something to then bring it up later because I'll just expose a load of noise, just kind of. Um, if you wanna brighten something up, just do it in camera versus doing it later in Lightroom or in Capture One. Now let's talk about lenses. There are some good and bad bits. The good bit is that the medium lens or the wide lens can focus really closely on whatever subject you want to take a picture of, which means you can get some nice close-up details. Obviously, it's not a macro, but it's not bad at all. The bad bits are, so I like lens flares. In many of my images, lens flares play a prominent role. Um, and generally with, let's say, my Fujifilm cameras and lenses, I get very beautiful, very nice lens flares. With the iPhone, it's the total opposite. Um, on the wide angle, actually on all three lenses, you get these horrible flares. At best, it's a small blue dot somewhere in the image. And okay, that's easy to remove in Photoshop. However, at worst, you have this green big blob um, right in the middle of the photo. And there's no clear way that I found to remove it. Um, you can recompose, 
to get that blob to go into where the source of light is coming from, but uh, then you might not have the right composition. Now, obviously, you only get this if you shoot into a source of light, but if you like that style of photography like I do, this can become a bit of an issue. Um, it's not ruined too many images, but sometimes if, it's, if it comes up, it's a real pain to try and hide it or get rid of it. So it's just something to keep in mind. Now let me quickly touch on night mode, shooting at night, and the various features and pros and cons of this night mode. So first of all, this is a bit of a tip for everyone, but mainly for me because I do it all the time. So my style of street photography is very quick. I often don't stop before taking pictures and I take pictures as I'm walking. Um, during the day, this is not a problem, but at night, um, the phone does reduce the shutter speed quite a lot. So if you're gonna be taking pictures at night, you have to really slow down, you know, stop, compose, take your time, and then you'll have good results. If you're walking around, if you're moving around, just expect to have a high number of blurry images. Um, that's what I've found in my experience. Now, the night mode on the camera, it has an automatic mode, off and a manual mode. So the night mode effectively just means there's a longer exposure. I think up to two or three seconds, depending on how dark it is. In most cases around London, um, because there's quite a lot of street lights, um, I found it to be between one and two seconds. Now, there are some pros and cons with this night mode. So the first pro is that the images do seem to be a, lot, uh, a fair bit less noisy using the longer shutter speed, I would imagine, because the ISO is then reduced. The negative of that is if you do have any movement in your image, whether it's you having a bit of a shake or someone walking past, rather than just having a blurry subject walking through the frame, you can get some really weird, like, artifacts and just, like, it's just weirdness, as you can probably see right now, going on with the image. I don't know what it is, I don't know why it's doing that, but it's something you need to keep in mind. Now, if it's a very still scene, you wouldn't have a problem, and I would manually go into the two second timer, um, sorry, two second exposure, to get the cleanest possible image. Um, one thing to remember is the telephoto lens doesn't have that feature, not that I have found it, it only applies to the wide and the ultra wide. Um, and generally, that's it. Now, in terms of the image quality itself, uh, to be honest, it's good. I would still go and take my sort of opinions from the previous section and say the images are way too sharp. However, the colors are definitely natural, they're nice, they're pleasant, um, and I don't have any issues with the color uh, in the night mode. In terms of image noise, there is a bit of noise, don't get me wrong, but it's nowhere near as bad as you think it is for a phone. Um, could I use these images and, you know, not professionally, but certainly to post them? Um, yeah, sure, no problem. But I think at night, I would still take my camera if I can, simply because of a larger sensor. Although I can't test the RAW files, I thought I'll give the JPEGs a go and see how far I can push those in uh, Capture One. So I know this phone does this HEIC format as well, but some editors don't recognize it, so I'll always switch it to JPEG. Now, shadow recovery is decent. You do have a lot of noise as soon as you push the shadows a little bit too much, but for a JPEG, that's to be expected, especially from a small sensor but you can recover shadows if you're careful. Highlights, on the other hand, are almost non-recoverable. So if you can use the HDR to capture the detail in the sky, I would highly recommend you do that because any blown out area, you've pretty much lost everything there. In terms of color, you can play around and change color quite well with the JPEGs. Uh, obviously, you'll have some weirdness going on if you zoom in, but generally speaking, um, you can definitely play around. I'll be interested to see how the raw files compare when that feature comes out, though. Due to how small the sensor is, there's really not much for the autofocus system to do here. At normal shooting distances, 
everything is in focus anyway. You only get separation if you use the telephoto lens and you get closer to the subject. When that happens, the autofocus seems good. It's very natural. It doesn't hunt too much. It acquires focus quickly and I have not experienced any issues with it myself. It has got a phase detection feature, which is also fairly decent. It seems to pick up people without major issues. Um, but it's not something that I'll really dwell on because, again, for street photography at normal distances, um, everything's in focus and there's really not much this system that has to do for that. But if you are going to be focusing on closer subjects, um, then the autofocus is decent. I can't remember where I read this comment, but it was on the lines of, if you want to do proper photography and print your photos, you need a camera, you can't use a phone. Now, for some cases, or certainly five years ago, it was true, but I don't think it's as true now as a lot of people think it is. And what I've done is I've taken one of the photos that I took on that POV street photography video that I did, and I printed it in A2, just to see how it looks. I was surprised. Let me show you. Look at that. Can you see it? Yeah. That, ladies and gentlemen, is printed on a phone. I was well surprised with that print. As a matter of fact, at the printers themselves, the people who printed, they were like, this is from a phone, this is incredible. Um, typically they wouldn't print phone pictures any larger than 4x6 and that's A2 which is massive for a 12 megapixel sensor. Now obviously if you start zooming in and looking very close to it you will start to see some noise, you will start to see some pixelation um, and generally you can't even compare that to a proper camera. However an A2 print like that on the wall no one in their right mind will be standing next to it like this um, and you'll be looking at it from afar. And from afar, it looks like it could be any camera, you know? So my point here is even from something as small as this, you can print and get good results. And that's a JPEG photo as well. I'm pretty sure a raw file would have been cleaner as well. And the giveaway is that print. So if you head over to my Instagram, links below, and I've literally just posted now to tell everyone on Instagram to come and watch this video. And on that post, if you just comment um, something, I don't know what, just leave a comment down below and I will pick a random winner on that Instagram post and they will get a copy of that photo. Um, so yeah, does it print? Yes. So time for a quick summary. Do I like this phone? Do I like this camera? The answer is yes. Um, I managed to get some great photos with it this week and I certainly wouldn't have any issues about taking this knowing that I will be taking pictures and leaving my camera at home. Will I prefer the iPhone over a proper camera? Absolutely not. I will always endeavor to take my camera, but for scenarios where I can't or shouldn't have my camera with me for whatever reason, I will happily use the phone. Do I recommend it? That is a lot more difficult because it's a very expensive phone. A thousand pounds is a lot of money and for that you can get a very good uh, iPhone 11 which has been used and a Fujifilm X-T2 or something on those lines which is a very good capable camera. So if you have a decent camera set up at home and you just want a pocketable camera instead of taking a point and shoot or something like that then i would recommend this phone i do think it's a very good capable camera um, however if you don't and this is your first camera i would definitely not recommend it i would say buy something cheaper if you can't afford it and then get a proper camera because that will definitely be a much better use of money than plowing everything into a phone so Overall, I'm pleased. I'll be looking forward to using it more and more. Um, and until the next iPhone release, I guess that's it. So I'm sure you might have some questions, comments, etc. Please write them down below. I will endeavor to get back to every single one of you. Um, like the video if you like it. Subscribe if you're not subscribed already. And I shall see you in the next video. Thank you ever so much for your time, your attention, 
Um, and yeah, have a fantastic day and see you soon. Bye.